In this video we're going to take a look at day 3 of the Hack the Box Cyber Santa Capture Flag competition. We've got a new challenge for each day of the competition, so we're going to go through in order of the number of solves currently. We've got our web challenge first with 335 solves, and then crypto with 162, and then forensics with 143, pwn with 75, and reversing with 55, which I haven't yet done, so hopefully we get that one finished as well. Uh, but let's start off with this web challenge, it's called Gadget Santa, and the description says It seems the evil elves have broken the controller gadget for the good old candy cane factory. Can you team up with the real red team Santa to hack back? So as with the previous challenges, we've got a server to launch and we've got some source codes to download as well. I'm going to go straight to the server. I'm just going to go through this as I did when I was solving it, because obviously the competition starts, you might not want to jump straight into the source code, you might want to go and see if you can quickly identify what the vulnerability is and exploit it. So we go to the site, we've got this terminal running where we can call UPS status, restart, list processes, list RAM, list connections, list storage. Uh, immediately you might notice that these are commands that we can run on our Linux terminal. That would immediately make me think about command injection. We've got a command up here which is being sent as the query and depending on what we select here it has some different options. But we know that if we're in the Linux terminal and we do ls or something like that, we can run one command, but we can also do ls and then enter a semicolon and then say, I don't know, ifconfig and that will run both commands one after the other. We can do other things as well, we can use the pipe characters, and we can use ands, we can use the bash syntax to execute commands. So sometimes these things will be filtered out and that's what we want to test for first of all. So let's try and do semicolon ls and you'll see we get back the list of the files in the directory. So the next thing we might want to try is to see can we list a directory up. Let's do ls dot dot slash and we don't get anything there. Let's see if we're maybe the space is being blocked or maybe it's the command. So we might try another command like id but id works so it seems like the space is being blocked. So we might want to go and have a look at the source code at this stage. What I actually did first of all here was just to search uh, bypass space filter bash. We can open up our good old hack tricks and look at some of the examples in here. So you can see here we've got some examples, bypass IP, IP filtering, forbidden spaces is what we're interested in. And we've got a few different options here. I went through and I tried a couple of them. This one was actually the one that worked for me. But we're not going to be able to cat the... Oh, we can cat ETC password. Okay. I didn't think that worked for me earlier. Uh, all right, well, that's good stuff. Let's try and do ls, and then we'll use that as a space. Uh, so we can do dot dot slash, and we can list the directory up. We might want to then try to cat out the shell scripts. and that also works for us. Uh, but we have a lot of this code available to us, so as soon as I haven't seen any flag mentioned there or any files worth reading, let's go and take a look at the source code and see where the flag is. So we're going to have a look at the config first of all. We'll see that we have that Santa Mon SH. We also have this UPS manager which if we go back to list the directories I don't believe we saw here, no, so that should be in the same directory as santa underscore mon but we don't see it and if we take a look at the UPS manager at the code we have this get json, we've got a check service so this seems to be the commands that we're running if we have a look here, we've got this UPS status, we've got restart, we've got list processes, and we've got the restart here, we've got a check service, and these are the outputs that we get whenever that runs. We've also got this option where we can call restart, so we already did that as well, the restart service, and there's another one, get flag. So let's just go back there and see, first of all, this is set to command equals list processes. Is it as simple as saying get flag? It's not. So we can go back here. So this is actually a directory if self.path equals get flag. Let me go back and do this restart. Because whenever we restart there, 
it's very very similar code here so it's saying if it's restart call this and that's what we're seeing so can we try to make a curl request or a wget request to this get flag directory let's have a look and see what the IP addresses of the local server it's 127.0.0.1 3000 so if we were to go here and inject a command and say we want to curl uh, we can't use a space can we let's go back to one of these commands and we'll do curl HTTP 127.0.0.1 133 no sorry not 1337 I'm so used to it being on that port 3000 get flag and then we run that and we get back our flag so we didn't really need to look through too much of the code there to work out what's going on in fact we didn't actually ch touch the challenge directory at all sometimes going in there can cause a little bit of extra confusion if none of this is actually relevant to the challenge and you stumble across these these files before you stumble across the UPS manager then you might sp waste a bit of time basically uh, so it's a good idea just to have a quick flick through these and just see which ones have any interesting keywords in them especially if it's a challenge where the flag is being held somewhere like this UPS manager one the next challenge is called missing reindeer it's a crypto challenge and the description says not only elves took control of Santa's Christmas factory but they kidnapped Rudolph as well our cyber spies managed to capture an email related to Santa's favorite reindeer. Can you help them decrypt the message? So we've got a file to download. In this case, it was actually an email. Let's open it up. Message.email. And we've basically got an email that's been sent here. It says, hello, Mr. Jingles. We got the reindeer as you requested. There's a problem, though. Its nose is so red and bright that it makes it very hard to hide him anywhere near the North Pole. We have moved to a secret location far away. I have encrypted this information with your public key in case you know who is watching. And we've got a public key here. My immediate thought when I saw this was it's very small. Normally you see quite a few lines of Base64 text here. And we've also got what looks like our Base64. Uh, we've got, uh, well, it actually says here secret.enc. So we have a Base64 encoded um, ciphertext and we've got a public key. So hopefully we'll be able to crack this public key. This is the kind of crypto challenge that I like where I don't have to do any of the maths and hopefully can just use a tool to do it for me. I'm going to call this ciphertext.base64 paste that in and we also want to create a public.key and we'll grab the key from here. So we used the RSA tool on I think the day one video not to actually solve the challenge but just to generate a public key and that's another tool that I'm going to return to to solve this challenge. The reason being it has quite a lot of different attacks. You can see these different attacks here that will just run by default. If we just provide it a file that we want to uncipher, you can see here we have uncipher file or we can uncipher the actual base64 text as well, that'd be fine. And we can provide a public key, we can provide a private key or we can try to retrieve a private key etc. And in fact, this is exactly what we're going to do here. Uncipher file, we're going to run the, the script with a public key and then the file that we want to uncipher. So let's go and download the repo. I don't still have it from the other day. I typically reset my VM to a snapshot after I've done a CTF or even just at the end of a few hours of just like my having loads of files and newly installed packages and scripts and things that I just don't want to be permanently on my VM. It also means that whenever I'm making videos and things like that, I generally don't have things installed. So if people who are watching the video run into the same issues and they need to set up something or configure something, I also have to do it. Okay, so with the RSA tool here, what we can do with that public key is dump some of the parameters. So we can say here, public key dot dot slash public key, and then do dump. And this will tell us what the N is and what the E is. And you can see the E is very small. So there are a variety of attacks that you could could be used against this. We could search something like exponent here to see which ones would line up. What I actually did at the time was just run this in the background while I was working on other challenges. So without even specifying an attack, we can just say we want to uncipher a file and it will try all the different attacks on it. So we'll do that with 
uh, what's it called ciphertext.base64 you could also have here recover an option to recover the private key dash dash private let's enable that as well we'll start running through this it took about five minutes whenever I did this during a CTF although I installed Sage Math afterwards because I got a lot of errors with some of the attacks saying it couldn't run because of Sage Math and I, uninstall I installed Sage Math and then whenever I tried to run this again it actually took a really long time so I've uninstalled Sage Math hopefully this will just take a few minutes to run in the meantime if you do like crypto unlike myself and you want to go and understand a bit more about some of these challenges and how you could accomplish this manually there's some good walkthroughs out there this one goes through a lot of different RSA challenges applying theoretical attack and we have some Python scripts in here, some examples of different challenges from CTFs which might which might come across in future. Um, I'm going to go back and let's wait for this CTF tool to complete. Okay, so that actually took about five minutes to come back I'd say. It probably would be quicker just to go and use a script because you know that, that what the issue is we've got a weak exponent as we could see whenever we dumped out the public key it didn't manage to retrieve the private key but we did get back our flag the next challenge is called persist it's a forensics challenge and the description says although Santa just updated his infra problems still occur he keeps complaining about slow boot time and a blue window popping up for a split second during startup the IT support elves the IT elf support suggested that he should restart his computer, our uh, classic IT support. So we've got this zip to download. It's another memory image like we dealt with previously. So we could go over to Hacktricks and have a look at the volatility reference, the volatility cheat sheet, or we could go and have a look at the reference again on GitHub. I'm not going to go back to the GitHub reference. I'm going to kind of go through this one a little bit quicker. Let's just go and open up the cheat sheet. And remember we've got this auto volatility which you can use to basically run through all the different plugins in one go and kind of dump everything out. We've got volatility 2 and 3. If you're using 3 you don't need to specify a profile. But if you're using 2 you do. I've already gone ahead and done that and it's the same profile as we were using last time. So you need to specify that each time you run a plugin. And you have some examples here. So if you're using volatility 2 we'll be using this syntax. And this one didn't really take me too long. We're told we mentioned it mentioned something about persistence, maybe. Oh no, it didn't. It, yeah, it did. During a second startup, it said the window was popping up. So there's some kind of persistence there. And a common technique is to put that into the registry. So if we go back here and run, we've got our profile now. Let's set the profile to this one. And we can run something like hive list. I'm not going to run through all the various commands that we ran through last time. You could do, the, I think there was some stuff in the command line and uh, you can have a look at environment variables and have a look at the processes and things like that. But based on the challenge description I've got a good idea where we need to go here. It's not, oh I still have image info as a plugin. So we run through that and it comes back with these registry keys. We could dump some of these out so we could go and say hive dump and then specify an offset or we can use print key which is what I'm going to use so we can say print key and provide the key that we want to print I'm just going to go and copy and paste this but essentially I'm looking to grab this registry key of run and also of run once which are often used for persistence So we saw some, what looks like some kind of base64 code here and again we have another PowerShell command like we had with the last forensics challenge yesterday. So let's go and take a copy of this, let's go and decode it. We could just go to our terminal and say echo, echo that out to, oh that was supposed to go in the middle of the quotes, what happened? Echo, yep, yeah. base64-d and that'll decode that for us and that's it we've got back our flag so that was a nice quick and easy one if you know what to look for um, if you didn't you could kind of search 
uh, forensics persistence or forensics persistence techniques or something like that and straight away you'll see here persistence registry keys and it tells you about indicators of compromise you can look for and where these registry keys are located and how to identify malware. The next challenge is called Naughty List. It's a pwn challenge and the description says the elves have stolen Santa's list and now he does not know who is good and who is bad. This form will help him recreate his list and send out the gifts. Were you good, good enough or were you naughty? And again we've got a service to connect to but we've also got a binary to download and this one came with a libc library which is a big hint as to what the vulnerability is going to be but let's just go ahead and we'll check the file type for naughty list we'll see it's not stripped again so it's going to be quite easy to reverse engineer or well it's not going to be as hard as it would be if it was stripped there's no pi either so that's good let's also check the binary protection see what's been different to the last couple of pwn challenges we did and in this case we've got full railroad so not really going to be too important here. We've got no canaries, so we don't need to worry about that if there is a buffer overflow, which this is a good indication there will be. NX is enabled, so in yesterday's challenge we injected shellcode onto the stack and executed it. We're not going to be able to do that here. And no pi, so this is going to make it a little bit easier. The addresses are going to be the same each time the program runs. So let's make it executable and just have a play around with it before we go and have a look in Geardra. It asks us to enter a name, says name uh, let, letters only. You can just enter in a few characters here. We could try to overflow these. I'm going to put in the age and then it asks us name of the gift you want and why you're good enough to deserve it. And on that one I put in plenty of A's and got back a segmentation fault which means we've crashed the program. We've probably overwritten the instruction pointer with something uh, which isn't a valid memory address i.e. these A's. So let's go and take a look at it in Geardra. I'm going to try and speed through this a little bit quicker than some of the pwn challenges that I've done videos for in the past. So if I go through this too quickly for you, you think I'm missing stuff out that uh, it's not really making sense. Go back and try and look at some of my earlier pwn videos as I'll try not to cover everything, but I'll try to cover enough that it will make sense for somebody who, who might not have done this challenge before. Uh, so we've got these various functions here anyway. Set up, we've got a banner. We've had these in the previous challenges. This is literally just to do some animations. So it might look quite intimidating, you've got some stuff going on here, you don't know what it's what it's doing but it's not actually relevant to the challenge. We have then the get names, we could go and have a look here and see what's going on. It's making sure that the name is within a certain character range, it's looping through and making sure let's see if this is going to fit here, we've got a 1F characters being read. Uh, let's just actually keep going through because whenever I, the way I solved this was I had a quick look at that function. I had a quick look at this one as well and thought this looks quite similar to the last one. Uh, and actually we've already got a segmentation fault on it on the the last one. So yeah, this doesn't really matter too much. We're going to enter in our name, we're going to do our surname, we're going to get the enter in an age. It's going to display that out and then it's going to call get description. And get description has a 32 byte buffer. And it's reading in 3C0 bytes, which if we go over here onto the left and highlight it, is 960 in decimals. So we've got a lot of space there if we overflow this buffer. And let's go and see if we can exploit it then. But what are we going to try to inject there? If we think back to day one's challenge, we had a, a function here somewhere that we could just return to and it would print out the flag or get a shell or something like that. So like a win function. In the second day we were able to execute our own shellcode on the stack, so we just injected some shellcode and executed it. Today we don't have either of those options, we can't inject shellcode, we've got no interest in functions here which are going to print the flag for us, and we've been given this libc library which is kind of a hint that we want to return to libc, so libc has a lot of interest in functions in it, and basically if we go and have a look at our global offset table here, here's the different functions which are part of libc. And every version of libc will have slightly different offsets for these functions. And every operating system, or well, different operating systems will have different versions of libc on them. So essentially what happens, rather than whenever you build a program, rather than just including all of this code, so do printf and do alarm and read and all that sort of stuff in there, it will just uh, insert these into the global offset table. And then the first time these functions are called within the program, it's going to go off to your libc library, find out where that offset is, and then it'll populate this global offset table with the address of 
that function in libc. And once we once that's been loaded, if we can leak that address, we can then return to that function because we know what, what the address is. And then we can start finding our way to other functions within libc. So hopefully that made sense. Let's go and see if we can start to put it together and it'll probably make a little bit more sense. And actually what I'm going to do rather than grabbing the template and building this up from scratch, which I quite often do in these videos, I'm going to go back to a recent Hack the Box CTF, uh, which had some similar challenges in it. Not that challenges are reused, these are just common challenges. There's only so many, you know, CTFs will have a return to libc attack or a return to win or a shellcode injection challenge. And as long as they're different enough that people who don't understand what the challenge is about can just copy a script, it's not, it doesn't really matter too much. But in this case, I was able to go and have a look at scripts that had been put together or that I'd put together in that last in a video for the Syntax Red Team CTF. And let me just talk through. I'm going to copy this over to Codium because I find it it looks a bit better. I'm not actually going to run this script. I'm just going to show this is kind of the, the manual approach I would take whenever solving these challenges. So let's open this up in Codium. As in the previous challenges, we're just using this template. So all this stuff up here is not really anything to worry about. We're just using this as a helper function just so we can easily swap between GDB and remote and local. And we've got this to find the offset to the instruction pointer. And then just setting up our login and things like that. And here's our code. So we've, ident we've set up our libc library here. This is my local libc library. And this is the libc library we've downloaded for the server. So whenever I want to run against the server, I'll uncomment this and vice versa. We're finding the instruction pointer offset and I've got a RDI gadget here. So essentially what I've done is I've gone and done ropper dash dash file on naughty list, for example. These are the rop gadgets we have here. We can go ahead and we can search for pop RDI and we get an address here and we can basically go and paste this into our scripts and this is something that we'll need whenever we're building up our payloads here so you can see we've got our first payload to leak the libc function and this is what I was talking about a second ago so in our previous challenges we've overwritten the instruction pointer with either the location of some shellcode that we've put on the stack or with the address of a win function in this case we're gonna leak out the address of a global offset table function in this case I've chosen puts but you could quite easily say printf or something else here and what I'm doing here is we're basically popping this into the RDI, the global offset table puts address. And then whenever we call puts, it's going to grab the puts address from the RDI and then it's going to print it to the screen. So if we change this to, you know, gets, that would do the same thing. It would put the gets address in the RDI register. And then whenever puts is called, it looks into the RDI register for its parameter. It sees that it's got the gets address and then it prints that location out to the screen. And then we need to do another payload. So we need to go back to, once we've once we've exploited this. Oh, that's the wrong one. Display. Oh no, sorry, that was the right one. Get description. So once we've exploited this, we've overflown the buffer, we've printed out the address of our libc library, but we haven't got a shell, we haven't printed the flag. So we need to go back to the beginning. In this example, I went back to main, but actually we could say that we want to go back to get description. So we've leaked our address. We're going to go back to the start of this function so that we can do another buffer overflow. And this time we're going to pivot from the global offset table address from the libc library address that we've leaked to a libc function that's going to be of use to us. So yeah, we're just sending the payload off here. We print out our leaked address. We're then going to find out what's the base address of libc. And we can do that by subtracting because we have our libc library loaded here as an elf, we know where all those functions are in our local libc library or the server one that we've got downloaded. So we can just say that whatever address has been leaked, subtract the libc.symbols.puts from it. That gets us back to the base of the libc library. And then we can start finding our way to other functions. For example, libc, I've, I've actually updated the libc base address here. So we've actually updated the elf. So we're now using whatever the server has. We can then go ahead and call system, so we're calling system here, we're passing in bin sh, which we're just searching for again in the libc library, 
and we just build up another payload. So we pop the bin sh string into the RDI, and then system's going to be called, and that's basically just going to run system uh, bin slash sh, which is obviously going to ret retrieve a shell for us. Now, I recommend whenever you're learning buffer overflows, I do kind of recommend going and finding these addresses manually. So you can do that in GDB, you can do that with read elf, you can you know, use strings to go and find these offsets in the libc library. And then you can go and use something like the libc database to go and find out what, whenever the server leaks an address, you can go and identify what version of libc the server's using just by putting in the address and the function here. I'm not going to go through all that because I feel like if you want to go back and if you want to learn a bit more about that, just go back through and have a look at some of my previous videos where I explain that in more depth. I particularly recommend the ROP Emporium series, which I did. It was one of the first video series I did, so the quality of the videos aren't very good. But in terms of the actual code, you know, you've got eight challenges. Each one is a 32-bit and a 64-bit challenge. And I went through, and each one I tried to do like a really manual script where we locate all of the address offsets and we put everything together manually. And then I would go and try to do an autopwn script where I just tried to make it in as little code as possible using rop objects and cool things like that. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, go back and you can kind of go through those. I'll try not to I'll try not to cover everything again. So that's how we would go ahead and do this anyway. I'm gonna show how I actually solved the challenge. I didn't even look at this script. What I did was grabbed my rop star script. So this is for the same challenge, but I just did two scripts for it. And this Ropstar script will automate things even more. I mean, this script is so reusable. I think I've probably solved about 10 challenges just by just by changing like three or four lines in the script each time. So for example there, we want to grab this pop RDI gadget. In fact, sorry, I have a pop RDI gadget there. We don't need to, we don't need that at all. The reason we don't need it is because it's going to find all that for us. Oh, sorry, this is a ret gadget. Okay, we might need the ret gadget. Sometimes if the if the stack isn't 16 byte aligned, sometimes you'll need to align it, and that's why I've inserted that there. Um, I wouldn't need this locally typically, but whenever we're running against a remote server, often we do. So a few things we need to go and update here anyway. We need to update, obviously, our file name is naughty list. So this is exactly how I solved the challenge. I changed that first of all. Remember that we need to enter in a na name, surname, forename, and an age, and they're all separated by colons. Oh, sorry, they're all the prompt for each one of them is a colon, as we can verify here. So we're going to say once you see a colon, it's asking you for. Let me just insert some bytes here because. The updated pwn tools is really funny about it. It works, but it'll give you some errors. Um, and we'll just go here and say crypto. So after you see a colon, send crypto. After you see another one, send cat. After you see another one, it's the age. So then we send off the payloads, crash the program. It's going to find out what the offset is to the instruction pointer. And it's going to return that for us here. We could run that and verify it. I'm not even going to bother. Let's just keep going. This is the interesting part here. So here we've actually created a ROP object, as you can see here, which can simplify the generation of ROP chains. So if we go back just very quickly to that script we were looking at a second ago, to the kind of more manual version of this, we built up this payload and we said pop RDI and we put in the global offset table puts address into the RDI, the call inputs, and we're going back to main. But actually, if we create a ROP object and give it the binary as a parameter, it can find all of that for us and build the ROP chain. So we can just say, we want you to find how, out how to call puts, and this is the parameter we want you to put out. And then we want you to go back to main. In this case, I'm going to say, go back to, what was it, get description? Yeah. So rather than going back to main, where we would have to enter in all of our details again, our name and all that. Let's just go back to the buffer overflow. We also need to do this at the start, just for our initial data entry. Oh, I meant to put the bytes in there. 
It's really annoying me how they've updated Pwn Tools to complain every time you don't have that now. Okay, so there we go. It's not after an angular bracket in this case, it's after a semicolon. I'm also going to do pretty print rop.dump just so that we can have a look at the rop chain. Uh, let's see if that works. We might need to convert it to a chain first before we dump it. And then we've got some we've got a receive line here. We're leaking out the puts, so we were just actually printing out the puts address here. So that's exactly the same as it was in the previous example. We've done our first payload. We leak out the addresses, and then our second payload. Remember, we did the same thing again, where we had to build up this payload, pop RDI, put in the bin sh, etc. In this case, I'm just doing one line, rop dot system, and we're searching for the bin sh string. And note that we had to update our rop object. So our rop object is no longer an object of our vulnerable binary. It's actually the libc that we're using now, so that we can find the, so that we can resolve these functions and these addresses and things. And again, we're going to do rop.dump just so we can go and have a look and see what kind of rop chain it's built up and how it's done that. And we're going to send that off as a payload. So I mean, very little has actually been changed there. We have updated our binary name. We've updated just some of the inputs and the outputs, really. But in terms of the exploit, everything is the same here. And we might need to modify some of these receive lines and stuff like that just to deal with the output as well but we shouldn't need to change any of our payloads at all. Let's go and try it out locally first of all. Have we got this libc? Let's update the libc library to our local version and I'm going to try and just run was that the rec gadget that we had there as well? Let me just make sure that was 536756 uh, again probably isn't needed locally but it might be on the server side Alright, we run python exploit, it runs through, and notice here that we've got end of file, so it didn't work, and also the address that it's leaked, that doesn't look like the right format for us. You can see here, it's the libc base is 31333, which isn't definitely isn't correct. So yeah, we need to go and play around basically with the receive lines here. I actually did that and worked out that it was... I think we need to do io dot receive lines six lines before it's going to leak the address, and then sorry six lines. So we're going to send off our first payload, and then it's going to we're going to receive six lines, and then the seventh line is going to be our leaked address, and hopefully that's. All right, let's try it out. We run through that, we get a shell, and it doesn't say end of files. So we can try and do ID, we can try and list our files, and it seems to have worked for us. And if we go and have a look through that, we can actually see, because we did this rop.dump, we can actually see the payload it's put together. So the payload is like what we put together manually here on the, the manual GitHub version where you can see it's identified the address of pop RDI. It's popped the, in this case, the bin sh string into the RDI from the libc library, and then it's called system. And in our first payload, it's popped the got puts address into the RDI, and then it called puts, and then it called get description. So this is the payload it's built. So something worth bearing in mind, if you're doing a challenge and you really can't get a payload working, you might be able to actually automate it and then just print out the result to try and learn how to do it. Which is something I've actually done with format string vulnerabilities before, you know, use Pwn tools and then printed out the payload that it puts together and then use that to identify how you would do it manually. Although I still kind of struggle with those. Uh, so now we want to go and do this on the remote server anyway. I'm going to go and change the debug mode to info just so we get a little bit less output. I'm going to go and update this libc library. We want to tell it we want to use the one that we were provided for the server. But if we weren't doing that, I'll show you how we could identify it as well. Let's run this again. Sorry, let's run it with remotes and let's go and grab the server and the port number. Paste that in. run that on the remote server and very quickly it's dumped out the ROP gadgets but very quickly we get back 
our shell and we can cat the flag.txt. So yeah, if we hadn't been given that libc library, uh, how would we identify what the server's using? We would basically leak out the address. So we know that we're leaking out the global offset table puts address because that's what we've specified. So we'd go and grab this address here. We would go to that libc database. And let's just put that in here. Not in there, sorry, in this side. And in here we're going to say puts. And we'll do find. And that's going to tell us what libc libraries this could be. In this case, we've only got one possibility, which is this one here. And then we can just go in here and find out what are the offsets from the base or what's the difference from the library we're using. Another option is if you have like 10 or 15 libc libraries here and you don't want to manually go through and check each one, you could download them and then you could automate your script to just loop through all of the libc libraries in the folder and try and run the exploit and then just try and grab the flag out of the output. But yeah, that's how we can return to libc or ret to system anyway. So we've covered a return to win, we've covered injection of shellcode onto the stack and execution, and we've covered return to libc using ROP gadgets. Presumably tomorrow maybe we'll have a format string vulnerability or we'll have maybe a global offset table write um, pwn challenge or something, be interested to see. Uh, again, if I went over this too quickly for anybody, I've done a lot of different pwn videos and I repeat myself a lot in them, so if you're trying to learn this stuff, just go and watch a couple of those videos and eventually you'll, it'll sink in like it's kind of sunk in to me. The final challenge is called Intercept. It's a reversing challenge and the description says, we managed to covertly spy on some of the elves' communications as well as obtain partial code for their experimental encryption algorithm. Can you find out where they're planning the next meeting? So I've already got the files downloaded in this case. We've got two files. We've got a intercept.asm, which is assembly code, and we've got intercept.pcap, which is obviously a packet capture. Go and have a look at that one first of all. And we'll see there's only six packets in here to take a look at. We can follow the TCP stream and see what we've got here. Nothing readable anyway, so we might want to convert this into raw. Grab the hex values in case we need to use them later. But we obviously need to go and have a look and see what the ASM is doing as well. So we'll just save this here for later. Let's go and open this up in Codium, the assembly, intercept.asm. I've got an extension here to just give some syntax highlighting or some you know color coding for this. Uh, which you can just go and find down here in this extensions tab. I just searched ASM and installed the first thing which popped up. And we don't have too much here. We've got a our sections here at the beginning. We've got a do encrypt function, which is obviously going to be what we want to focus on. So I'm not an expert with assembly. I kind of know just as what I need to to get challenges done, whether it's reverse engineering or pwn, but I learn a little bit every now and then, forget it pretty quickly. Uh, but without a great understanding, we can still try to work through and just get an idea of what's going on here. If you're not too experienced with assembly, one thing which might confuse you looking at things like this is that you can see a mix of 64-bit and 32-bit registers being used. So we have an EAX being used here, but we also have RBP instead of EBP. Instead of ESP, we've got RSP. So it's 64-bit, but you can still use 32-bit registers. You can still use 32-bit data size. And similarly, you have this AL register. So if you go and Google AL register, and this is basically the lowest eight bits of the EAX. And you have that for each of the registers as well. So anytime you see, I, I quite often have to go and Google to see exactly what some of these registers are, just because I don't spend a lot of time looking at assembly. But yeah, so we've got basically, we know this is grabbing an 8 byte. We can see here it's moving 8 bytes anyway, but this just means it's moving it from the lowest 8 bits of the EAX. So at the beginning we had the EDI is the first parameter which is provided to functions. You have your EDI, your ESI, well, your RDI, RSI, and RAX. And so the parameter is being passed in, it's being moved into the EAX. And then the lowest 8 bits of that, which is 8 bytes we're dealing with anyway, is being moved to the stack. And then we have this move x zx instruction. We could go and Google this and see what it is. It's not really going to be too important for us in this case. It's kind of doing a similar thing in terms of, well, let's open it up anyway. We'll open up this documentation here. 
It's in this case we can move a byte to a word or to a double word or a quad word. So we're increasing the size but we're using the zero extension to basically keep it at the same value. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, it's not really too important anyway. Again, there are certain key parts here that we want to focus on, certain operations. A lot of this is just assembly being assembly, moving, creating pointers and moving things from place to place so that it can do the actual operations. But essentially, we've taken in a parameter, we've moved it about a bit from the EDI to the EAX and AL here, creating a, a byte pointer. The important thing is we'll see down here that we have 19 being added to the EAX and then we have an XOR that's being done with our previous value. We then have an add, to, we're adding 55 to the EAX and then it's going to move this into the states object with it, the RIP as the pointer. So you can see that this was used here, it was moved to the EAX and at the end of the encrypt function, the output value is moved into this as well. So this is going to be then reused when we get back to here as the encrypt function keeps looping around. So yeah, that, that's basically the core functionality of this. We have, we're taking in, say we're taking in a byte, as we can see here. We're taking in a byte at a time. We're adding 19. We're performing an XOR and then we're adding 55 and then we loop through saving the state of that the whole time. So we can go and try to put together a script to do that sort of equation and see if we can solve the challenge with the data that we've extracted in Sublime. Actually the data we have in Sublime here is not actually quite correct so you see the output we got here from saving the payloads in Wireshark but if we go and use T-Shark, in fact I can show in, the, in Wireshark here as well so if we go through the packets, let's have a look at the first packet. We've got our data here. Let's go to the next one. The next one doesn't have that data, but it has this TCP payload, which is the last 16 bytes. So in our first packet, we had the last six bytes. In the second one, we have this TCP pay payload, but it's not the same data type. If we, let's go back here. If you select this here and apply as a filter, you can actually see here that's data.data .data. and if we were looking at the TCP payload apply as filter selected that's TCP.payload so they're two different values so if we what we just extracted there didn't grab everything we can get some we can get some of this with T shark if we do T shark dash R intercept pass in that pcap and then we want to say we want to grab fields and we're interested in extracting the TCP.payload we run that and we get quite a different output here. So whenever I was doing this challenge I actually I was using that original Sublime, what we have in Sublime there and the first part of this decoded fine but then we ran into problems because this is incremental so each time it takes in a byte it's going to use the output of the encrypt function on the next byte. So if you miss any of the data here whenever going through to decrypt it's not going to give you the correct output so initially all I had working was this where it was printing hello but we didn't get any of this stuff here. Uh, yeah, so we need this stuff, we're basically going to put this on, on the one line and we'll go and paste this into our Python script. I'm just going to go and open up the solve script and we'll take a look at it. So our code here is relatively straightforward. We've got our encrypted data which we're going to unhex using the pwn tools function which is just going to convert hex decoder strings so you can see here you can put in some different values different data types and it'll decode that. And then we're going to set up our decryption in byte form. We're going to loop through each byte in the encrypted text and we're going to perform the calculations. So we need to, let's go back to our assembly. I wonder, can I, I'm not sure if I can split the screen on this. Yes, we can, but it's going to make it a little bit harder. There we go. All right, that's looking good. So we've got our encryption over here on the right. Let's see if we can go through it. We've got this add 19 that happens to begin with, which we have here. So we've got a loop counter, which is starting at zero. And we know that on the first iteration, there is going to be no 55 because it's going to add 19 and then it's going to do the XOR. It's only after that that it's going to add 55. So on the first iteration, this is going to be 55 times zero. So it's not actually going to apply. 
but we are going to do the plus 19 and then it's going to add 55 and go around for the next iteration and that will basically keep going all the way through so you could do that a little bit you could you could write that as like count equals 0 and then instead of saying 55 times i we could say count plus 19 and then we just do count plus equals 55 after each iteration that's it's functionally the same code but if we want to do it all on one line and save that variable variable space we can do um, so yeah we're going to do that we then need to XOR it with the byte uh, sorry we're first doing a modulus there as well so we need to make sure it's within the valid byte range which is 256 possible bytes from 00 to FF uh, so we'll make sure it's in the correct range and then convert it to a character and then XOR it with the byte that we're currently processing. That's going to keep looping through. As I say, it's important that we're not missing any data here because it'll influence the rest of the data. And then once we finish that, we're just going to print out the flag, hopefully. So hopefully that made sense. Let's go and try and run the program and see what happens. We run that. We get some errors about the Pwn Tools bytes issues which actually to be honest I, I found it hard initially to even see this text I think I ran the script a couple of times not even realizing that the flag was there because I was just seeing all these errors but we do have this at the end saying hello is this working looks like the connection is established our next meeting will be at 90 and it's got the coordinates there make sure to bring the stolen presence the password to get in will be and then we have our flag so yeah I'm not too sure exactly I'm not even really sure where the error is coming from in this case because I've set up bytes here, I've set up bytes here, we're doing decode here, I really don't know where that's coming from. Okay so that's going to wrap it up for day three of the Hack the Box Cyber Santa competition. We've got two more days left, there's more challenges out in about one hour so hopefully we'll be able to get all of those done as well. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, leave them down below, thanks.